Let's get right to the Word of God. I have something I need to share with you. If you have your copy of God's Word, navigate with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4. It's in Ephesians chapter 4. We've been in a series now called, a short series called, um, um, Light in the Darkness. Light in the Darkness. That's the series we're in, Light in the Darkness. And uh, last week we talked about coming out of darkness. We talked about it because God wants his children to walk in the light. The beautiful light. Amen. There's a difference between light and darkness. And we here at this church have been pressing uh, this year in this thing called It's Possible. Um, God's wanting to do different things in our lives. And sometimes it's hard to see that it's possible because of maybe our setbacks, maybe uh, some things we've encountered during the years that um, made us feel like, you know what, God can never use me in this way, God will never open this up to me, but I want everyone to know that all things are possible. Yes. Yes. There's nothing that's impossible. I don't care what the challenge is in your life today, there's nothing that is impossible with the Lord. So we've been walking through this thing, and the first thing we talked about was believe like it, that if we're going to see things that are possible, we must believe like it's possible. The second phase is to behave like it's possible. There are some things that must be done. Faith without works is dead. And works without faith is dead. You must have, there must be some actions with what we say we believe. And that's where we are. That's where we've camped out at for a little while, talking about believe, uh, behave like it. That we've got to deal with some things of behavior so that God can use you, that God can get the glory out of your life. Yes. He did not save you for you to sit and do nothing. Amen. He did not save you to sit on your blessed assurance and do the absolute thing. He saved you so that he could use you. He needs to show the world that he can use you, your name, you, who you are, your personality, your good and bad, all the who you are. God wants to use you and show you how much he loves you not based on any your performance, but just based on your relationship with Christ. But I had to bring this out. We had to talk about this darkness piece because we're in Ephesians chapter 4, and chapter 4 is there. It's in there. We have to talk about it, about darkness. Church, there is a difference between light and dark. I'm not just talking about light, meat, and dark meat, okay? Chicken breast and chicken thighs and legs. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking, I'm talking about in the world today, there's a difference between light and dark. It's not about perfection and us being perfect people. It's about God's children who are pursuing walking in the light. Amen. Paul's going to bring some of these things out. He gets practical. He addresses some issues that we got to address. He addresses some issues even in that local church congregation because even though we're saved, on our way to heaven, we have faith in Christ Jesus. Sometimes, as God's children, a little darkness can be around the corner in our life. Sometimes, in, as, as God's children, there are places and spaces in our hearts that we reserve for darkness. That we say, Lord, I don't want the light to shine on that because I may have to give it up or I may have to turn away from it. I may have to tell her no or tell him I can't. We can't do that anymore. There's sometimes that little little space and place in our hearts that may have some darkness there that we're trying to keep for ourselves. And God wants us to know, listen, whatever you give up for Him, He will give it back to you. Whatever you let go for Him, the Lord will reward you back. And it's always, God always, uh, He overgives. He, he, he does super abundantly. He always Listen, what we think is joy, and Lord says, I can show you what true joy really is. Mm -hmm. And it sometimes is not even attached to a person. Right. And it's hard yeah. to believe it's sometimes it's not even attached to a dollar sign. Yeah. Yeah. God knows how to give you peace and joy in your heart and your yeah. life. Yeah. Give you direction for your life to where you were saying, I didn't know what I was yeah. going to do in life. But when Christ comes into your life and you surrender, the Lord gives you direction. And that doesn't mean you'll be standing behind the pulpit. It just means God leads you in life. Right. Amen. Be used by Him in whatever area of life you're in. Can you say that? Amen. Awesome. So let's get to our text. Ephesians chapter uh, chapter 4. We're going to start at verse 25 and read to verse 32. It says this, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let us, each one of you, speak the truth with his neighbor, 
for we are members one of another. Verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no place or no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal. But rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands. So that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Verse 29, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths. But only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Last verse, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. 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 See, Reverend, that's heavy. I know. I know. I want to shout today, but I, I got to deal with this text. Some preaching sermons, you just can't shout all about it. You got to deal with some things so that God, listen, God just wants to work some good things on the inside of you. All we're going to talk about today is all good. Everybody say, it's all good. 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 This is the life of God. It is His Word. It is his word. How many of you, when you go to the doctor, the doctor would come up to you and say, I've got good news and I've got bad news. How many of you would say to the doctor, doctor, I only want the good news. How many would say, doctor, don't tell me any bad news. I don't want to hear it. I don't care what the test result says. All I want is the good news. Nobody? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. No, you don't want to say it. nobody. All, every one of us, <laughs> every one of us wants all the good news. Give me the bad and the good news. Preferably, give me the bad first. So that I can try to find the silver lining at the end, try to, try to determine this good news. Every one of us, when it comes to uh, wanting to know what's going on with us, have to deal sometimes with some bad news. We've got to know what's going on on the inside of us. And that's kind of what we're going to deal with today is, is we've got to get some diagnosis together today. God wants to reveal some things to us today as we're talking about light in the dark. And I want to talk to you specifically today about being sick from darkness. I want to talk about that. Being sick from the darkness. I want to talk about five diagnoses right here in this text. We just read it. I want to break it down for us as quickly as I can. I'm going to do about 4.7 minutes on each point so that way it don't take you too long. But I want 4.7, 4.7 minutes. <laughs> as we diagnose some things because, listen, uh, you can be sick and don't know it. And, and oftentimes, we can see signs that are happening around us. A little pain here, a continuous pain there, a little throb there that wasn't there before. You know, you saw a lump and there wasn't a matching set. Okay, that's when you start saying to yourself, there is something going on in my body. And we go to the professionals now and say, I need a diagnosis. I need you to diagnose this case, a cough that won't go away. It could be sinus, it could be a cold, or it could be something more. Whatever the case, we need a diagnosis. Because once you have a diagnosis, you know where you need to go. Once you know what's happening, you know whether you, what you need to deal with, what medications you need to take, what maybe you need to stay away from. Whatever the case, we need a diagnosis. And so in this, you have five diagnoses I want to point out to us today. Here's our first diagnosis in, in our text here that we're going to look at today. Are you ready? Here's the first one. It's in verse 25, but here's the diagnosis that sometimes church, as God's people, we get sick from the darkness because we have toxic intentions. Toxic intentions. It's in verse 25. He says this, therefore, having uh, put away falsehood, let us speak truth to our neighbors and to, to all the members in the household. Here's what we're dealing with, the toxic intentions. We have to deal with this issue of lying. Everybody say lying. 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 
I can tell I'm not going to be responsive today, so I'm just going to just going to press on in. Press, press on. You going to press on? Everybody say press on. Press on. Press on. Press on. We have to deal with lying. Because Paul wrote this text not to sinners. He wrote it to Christians. Paul wrote this text not to sinners. He wrote it to believers. Because he understands, he said in one passage, that um, bad company corrupts good character. Like Paul knew that sometimes when we're around certain things, it does something to our hearts and to our minds. We begin sometimes to emulate or copy some of the our environments that we're in. So he really, he wants to ask us, listen, don't just settle for where you are. Don't settle for certain actions that are against God's word. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pay attention to this. Here's a diagnosis that sometimes we have toxic intentions, which is lying. A lie is a statement that is contrary to fact, and it is spoken with the intent to deceive. When we told it, we had the intention that we were going to throw somebody off our course, is what the issue is all about. If somebody asks me, Reverend, what time is it? And I says, oh, it's, uh, it's, it's 4 o'clock. And then I wanted to realize my watch was broken. Well, and then I realized, you know what? It's not the correct time. You know what I did? I didn't lie because I really thought it was. My watch thought it was 4 o'clock. But if I told them it was 4 o'clock because I wanted them to be late from, to get into a particular spot, uh, buying something that I was going to buy, and I wanted to get there first and get it, what I did was I lied to throw them off track, to throw them off course, so it could benefit me. And that's what happens sometimes as Christians. Paul says, God's people, he says, don't walk in deception. Don't be a deceiver. That's what Gentiles, that's what we were before. He says, in every opportunity you can, live in the truth. This is important because as you work in corporate America and as you work with people, you and I, I myself, we are tempted to tell one that's not a little straight. <laughs> we're tempted to get racial and tell white lies. I mean, we're tempted to say things that we know are not true in order to... to, 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 to to avoid some punishment or to or to get ahead or to gain. And what he wants us to know, listen, do your best and let's tell the truth. Amen. He wants us to be truthful. It's important. He wants us to know this because he says hey, there is one liar who is the chief of all lies and it is Satan himself. It says in John 8 that he is the father of lies. It also says in something real heavy in Revelation 22 that, listen, that those who practice lying will not inherit the kingdom of God. Ooh. Those who live in the lie, who are constantly deceiving people, or trying to get ahead in life, he says that you and I, those who are doing that, may not enter the, to the kingdom of God. It's serious business. Lying is serious business. God says even a liar will not carry or be in my sight. God is all about truth. It's only when truth comes. It's when truth comes that you can expose deception and lies. That's why Jesus came to expose what the devil was doing. So, Reverend, that was the symptom that I gave you. The diagnosis is that uh, we have toxic intentions. And here's our symptoms that, you know, we lie. But here's the treatment. Still, verse 25. Watch the treatment. Let each one of us speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Here's what he says, that we need to be truthful to one another. God's people, I need you to be truthful with me. You need me to be truthful with you. He says we must be truthful people. If we lie like the world, when people need truth, they won't come to us. Because they say, y'all lie just like we do. You can't possibly have the truth. So he tells us, listen, I want you to be truthful to one another. But not only to be truthful to one another, you, you and I need to be trusted by one another. He says right there in the text, he says, listen, for we are members one of another. We need to, listen, in the army it is important that they trust one another. That each person has each other's back because they're going to be in dangerous situations and each man needs to know that this brother has my back. It's not about himself, but it's about the entire group. And when you and I, church, when you and I don't represent the truth, we're hurting one another. We need everybody to be truthful. We need everyone to be trustworthy. Reverend, this is heavy. It is. It's a responsibility for every believer. So he helps us to see this. And one diagnosis, number the first one, is toxic intentions. We need to be truthful and we need to be trusted. And here's the second diagnosis. It's toxic emotions. 
diagnosed with toxic emotions. The first one is lying, toxic emotions, and dealing with anger. Look at verse 27. It's in your Bible. Verse 27, 26 and 27. He says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath or your anger. He says, and give no place to the devil. Here's the symptom. Anger is an emotion aroused or caused by something that displeases us. Amen. Anger is something that 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 uh, is is nothing is sinful about anger. It's all about how we respond when we're angry. Uh -huh. Anger itself is not a sin. It's the response that we give that will determine whether or not we have crossed the line. Can you right. say amen? Right. amen? A woman tried to defend herself about her bad temper by saying, "I, I just don't know what happens. I, I just explode sometime and I get mad. I mean, it, it just I, it just is what it is." And her friend said to her, she says, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but after you've exploded like a shotgun, you should see the carnage you leave behind when you're done. That's you should right. see how your anger affects people. Right. You should see how your anger, your anger just doesn't, you might be mad, but then when you let it all out, who else do you hurt with your anger? I often said that hurt people hurt people. That's true. Say again, hurt people yeah. hurt people. Yeah. And he helps us to see here, he makes it plain, don't be angry. And he says, uh, be angry and sin not. Be angry. There's some things we ought to be mad about. Mm -hmm. There's some things that ought to get on our nerves. It's some things that we ought to say is wrong and there should be frustration. Every now and then there is a march that's necessary. Every now and then there is a, 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 a pumping your fist and pounding the pavement saying, no, this is injustice. There's some things we need to be angry about. But he said, but don't let our anger go too far. Don't let my, my madness, being angry about an injustice, cause me to take someone's life and call it for the sake of justice. I'm bringing justice. No, vengeance says, mine, saith the Lord, I shall, I will repay. So here's the symptom. He's telling us that anger is an emotion, but he says it's one that when we're displeased, we begin to let it out. Anger is not a sin because even God himself gets angry. But God's anger is not like our anger. God's anger is not like our anger. God, God gets angry for all the right reasons. Mm -hmm. One quote said like this, Aristotle said, Anyone can become angry, but to be angry with the right person, to the right degree, at the right time, for the right purpose, in the right way, is not easy. Only God is angry for the right reasons. For the right amount of time, yes. with the right people, with the right situation. Only God is because He knows beginning from the end. He knows the things you and I don't know. When you've been cheated, God knows who cheated you, how much they cheated you, why they cheated you. You and I may think it was one person, but it might have been four who was plotting on you. You and I don't know some of those dark things, those things that are done in secret. God does, and here's what he says. Now, don't let your anger cause you to sin in your life. Because sometimes you and I can't figure out why things keep happening. Sometimes we can't figure out how they could do that. But God knows, and he knows when to bring about justice. Amen. All the evil things you see in the world today. Day and, and, and blacks that are being killed and, and the child sex trafficking and the sex trafficking. It's not God doing it. It's evil hearted people and I want you to know they will not get away with what they're doing. Amen. God will bring justice and that brings that makes God angry. But he tells us, don't let this didn't let this anger get us all out of control. He helps us to see anger is the first step towards murder. That's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, that it, anger gets so bad that we, we are ready to commit murder. We are ready to do things uh, that are not good. And anger also, it gives a foothold to the devil, the enemy. You stay mad lo uh, long enough, the enemy will come in and he can make havoc in your mind. That's the symptoms. That's anger we're dealing with, a toxic emotion. But here's the treatment in verse 26. He says, so do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity for the devil. Here's what the Lord tells every Christian to do when you're mad, you're upset, you're flaming hot. Here's what he says every Christian ought to do. Here it is. Settle the matter quickly. Settle the matter quickly. You and your husband, y'all arguing, you know what you're going to have to do? Settle the matter quickly. Address the issue quickly. Some things cannot be solved overnight. Amen. It takes conversation. It takes some time. But it does take this one frame of reference. You say this to yourself. I'm going to do all I can to bring about reconciliation. 
But for right now, you and I need to step away from each other. Let's agree to come back together and deal with this. But give me, give me half the night to think this thing over. Because I don't want to say anything and do something that would be displeasing to God Almighty. Can you say amen? amen. He helps us to see that here's that diagnosis. The, the treatment here is that you and I must settle the issue before it escalates. Before it starts getting out of hand. That, that you know, money. All those things that, that we cherish and that we need and we want. He says, don't let any of these things cause us to let things get out of hand. Let's settle the matter quickly. Somebody owes you money, you might have you might have to forgive them and let it go. I'm just saying, think about it. I ain't telling you what to do. I'm just saying, think about it. Just think about it. You, you might. You might. You might. Because it's, it's ruined the friendship. It will ruin the friendship. And he avoiding, she avoiding. I don't know how you're going to do it, but it's possible you may have to forgive and then you never, ever, ever, never, never, ever let them borrow nothing else again. <laughs> Did he hear what I'm saying? Never, ever, never, never, ever give them anything else again. Settle the matter quickly before it escalates. Here's the second thing, the second treatment. He says, settle the issue before Satan comes in. Settle it before Satan comes in. Before you know it, you've got new thoughts in your head that won't yours. You've got ideas and things now the enemy's bringing into you about revenge and how to get back and how to make them pay for hurting you and how to, how to make sure they know you hurt you. And, and before you know it, you're saying things, doing things, putting it on Face and Twitter and all that kind of stuff. He says before you let anger get out of control, you need to settle it quickly. And number two, you need to do it, you need to do it before the devil comes in. He will come in. Yes. Oh, yes, he will come in. Yeah. He loves dark places. He loves evilness. He loves lying. He loves anger. He loves rage. Everything evil you can think of, you can find the devil right there. Amen. So he said, look, don't let that thing settle. I mean, don't let it stay there. Go ahead and settle it. And then listen, get busy before the enemy comes in and he starts having his way in your life. Can you say amen? amen. Wow, two diagnoses is down. We've got lying and now we've gotten anger. Here's the third diagnosis I want you to see here. Diagnosis number three he talks about Toxic appetites. Toxic appetites. I ain't talking about your food. I'm talking about something else. Toxic appetites. Here it is in verse 28. He wants to deal with this issue of stealing. He wants to deal with the issue of stealing. Look at verse 28. It says this. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. He's dealing today, also in this text here, with stealing. Reverend, God's people don't steal. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Yes, they don't. In your mind, they don't. Notice the symptoms here. To steal means to take property of another without permission or Right, uh, without permission or the right, especially uh, taking it by force. Here, here are other terms when it comes to stealing. Just listen, just so I make sure I can cover your case. Here's what the terms of stealing is. This is what some terms they call it. A bandit, a burglar, a criminal, a crook. Don't raise your hand. A murderer, a mugger, a pickpocket, a pirate, a robber, a swindler, a cheat, an embezzler, a hijacker. Housebreaker, a lifter, moonlighter, pilfler, a plunderer, a prowler, a shoplifter. Don't raise your hand if I called you out. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. He just, he has to point these out. Listen, because these were some things we did before Jesus. These were things we did before Jesus. When I, when, when I was not a Christian, I, I picked it up. You hear me? I picked it up. You leave it, I pick it up. You understand? Finders, keepers, losers. See, y'all did the same thing. Oh, yeah, look at me like that. What you want to do? I picked it up. Money on the ground. Woman well, Christian. Ooh, the Lord bless me. You know, don't even serve him. The Lord bless me. I picked it up, you know. Picking stuff up, you know. Worked somewhere one time and, you know. And, other folk were doing it. And I said, well, you know, I might as well give me one too. 
He says, as Christians, we are still tempted to do the same things we used to do. Amen. Just because I'm saved, that doesn't mean them Jordans don't look any different. They still, still nice looking shoes. Just because just I got saved, I don't mean money. Don't have no, no, no. I don't want money. No, baby, you, you want everything you still used to want. Now we have this issue of, of doing things God's way, the right way, trusting God. And he, he gives us some things in the text. So he, those symptoms there, he helped us to see that we are, we're, we're, we're stealing. When God says, thou shalt not steal, in the New Ten Commandments, he is instituting the right for everyone to have private ownership of property. That's why when somebody takes something that belongs to you, it burns you up. Because you worked hard for it. You put blood, sweat, and tears in it. And when somebody comes with a lazy self and takes something that didn't belong, that I worked for, it do, it do something to you. That's when the anger comes in. And you're like, Lord, help me not to sin in my anger. Because I put blood, sweat, and tears. I got up in the morning and went to work. And do all that kind of stuff. And then somebody comes and takes what belongs to me. Are you feeling what I'm saying? Anybody that's ever been robbed and had somebody take something from you, you understand what I'm saying? It's it's a violation to your person. You just, it's mine. I work for I didn't steal it. I didn't do nothing crazy. I earned it and I should have it. And that's what God instituted when he says, thou shalt not steal. He instituted the right to have private ownership of property. A man has the right to turn his strength into gains and to keep the gains and use it in any way he sees fit. When I work, I expect a paycheck. I ain't working for my help. Amen. When I get the money, I bless God in tithes and offerings, and then I'm able to do what I want to with my money, and, and, and anybody who comes to steal it is a crook, a criminal, a robber, a thief, an embezzler, a yeah. shopper. Everything you can think of, that's what they are. Amen. And he says, sometimes Christians get caught in stealing. Amen. So that's the symptoms. But here's the treatment. It's in verse 26. I thank God for his word. Every answer we need is in the Word of God. Verse 26 says this, But rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Notice what he says. Here's how to make sure, as a Christian, you don't get caught up into that. Here's where a principle he leaves with us, that you and I, number one, should do hard work. Okay, I'm sorry. I might go out here just in one, two, three. My check, my check. He says that we should do Hard work. Amen. Now I know those of you who are retired, you're over at retirement age, you know, you just hard work, you're like, boy, boy, boy please, I, I paid my time. I did my time in society. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm not feel you. I'm with you. I ain't talking about you. I ain't talking about you. But for the rest of us who who, who have to still get up and do the nine to five, you and I got a responsibility to do some hard work. Getting up in the morning. Early in the morning. To go to work. Getting up in the morning and it's raining outside. Cloudy day. Monday morning. My God, the Monday morning blues. It's cool outside. The bed is warm. But you know, you, you got to pay that light bill in a couple more days. You got to get up. You got to go to work. You know, you got you got bills due. You you got responsibilities. And and my granddaddy used to say to me, he says, son, responsibility will make you move. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Responsibility will make you move. You do what you have to do, even when you don't want to do it. You put time, extra time in, because you know you have responsibilities. He says, you and I got to get into our mind. Watch this to do hard work. But then something else he said about the hard work part. Well, Cloud, he said, not only do you do hard work, but do honest work. Let me park it right here for a second and talk about this for a minute. He said, not only do you do hard work, but do honest work. Let me say it one more time. Not only do you do hard work, but you do honest work. That's what he says. We do honest work with our own hands. And I can pump the brakes and I can, I can push this because... I find that even Christians who say they believe Jesus do some dirty work, do some dishonest work. And I can say of assurity and put it out there so your pastor will know, selling drugs is not honest work. It's not. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's right. No, no. You ain't had a clap. You ain't had a clap. That's I'm going to put it right there and push it. Push it hard. It is not, and I, man, you don't know how hard I hustle. You're not hustling. You're stealing lives. 
Yes. You might be making your pockets fat, but you're stealing life from a family. Some mother or father is taking money out of their own house that they should be putting on the table, giving it to you to support their habit. They hooked on your mess. Their family can't even eat a salt. Their family changes houses and changes places to live every few months because you help pushing. It, I, it might not be you. I'm talking to the camera. It's not you. Because you, you steadily pushing that stuff on them, talking about it's your hustle. You're a liar. You are a liar. It's not a hustle. What you're doing is dishonest work. And the lives that you destroy, you will have to give an account for it. Amen. You have to give an account for it. TV right. Right. <laughs> We have to give an account for it. It's not honest work. It's taking from people. It is hurting them. And some have died. And are dying. Because we are doing things that is dishonest. And I find that Christians may be caught up into such a thing. It's a hard thing to think about. But it's something we have to grapple with. And, and really wrestle with. And say no. And say hey this is not God. This is darkness. Let's come out of the light. Well, I'm black and you don't know all the things that are against me. Let me tell you, if God be for you, he is more yes. than the whole world against you. Yes. I want to tell you, you need to challenge yourself and elevate your faith in Christ Jesus that no good thing will God withhold to them who walk up rightly. God is an honorable and just God. And whatever is due to you, God will make sure you, he says, if you have need of it, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything you have need of, the Lord will make sure you get it. That's right. That's right. Preach, preach. All right, so anyway, he says, do hard work, do honest work, and finally, you need, everybody needs to do some heavenly work. He says, when you do some work, he says, do some work so that you may give to others who are in need. Yes, yes. He tells us that here, here's a good uh, treatment plan for us to avoid stealing. Do hard work, honest work, and some heavenly work. You ought to give to somebody. Not expecting it to come back. Just give to those that you know who are in need. Those that could benefit. Those that you know. Those that you know that ain't supporting the habit. But those that you know that need some help. He says you ought to give to them so that they can be blessed. And church, when you can do that, man, that'll bless, that'll bless you. God will bless you for such a, right. such an attitude in your heart. Can you say amen? amen. All right, listen, got to move on. Four, number four, number four. I got, I got that 12.8 minutes, all right? <laughs> number four. Here's the next one. Diagnosis number four is toxic speech. Toxic speech, verse 49, 29 says this. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up. As it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. He talks about toxic speech, that words that are absolutely worthless. Yes. Amen. There's also another translation that says like this. I think it's the New Living Translation says, And let no <laughs> foul speech come out of your mouth. Let no things that are unwholesome, unhealthy, unproductive, let none of these things in Christians... Don't let it come out of your mouth. James kind of said something like this. How can sweet water and bitter water come out of the same water fountain? He's, it's just, he says it's un unbelievable. It's, not, it's just not possible. That Christians, listen, I'm not talking about perfection, but I am saying to you there must be some, some difference. There's got to be some kind of press. He says that when we talk, people should know this is different. That what they, How they talk is different. The communication is different. Yes. Peter was exposed when Jesus died, was being crucified. When he was being taken into the courts, Peter was exposed because they recognized his speech and how he talked. He, they knew he had belonged to the one they were about to crucify, Jesus. There's something that should be about us that you get exposed. That Man, that's a Christian right there. They, they don't have to say, you don't have to quote Bible verses, but there just should, should be some, something about the way you talk that people know is something absolutely different about this brother and this sister in Christ Jesus. Amen. So he talks to us quickly about toxic speech. Here's a symptom, the word corrupt in this uh, text where he says, let no corrupt talk. The word corrupt refers to rotten fruit. It means that which is worthless, bad, or rotten. That he helps us to see that our mouths are connected to our hearts. Here's something Jesus said in that regard. That our mouths are connected to our hearts. That what comes out of our mouth 
is based on what is in our hearts. So he says in Matthew chapter 12, he says this, A tree is identified by the fruit it bears. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. Verse 34, he says, he talks to the, he's talking to Pharisees, that they were crooks. They, they tried to be religious and they were really unsaved. Verse 34, you brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from the treasure of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasure of an evil heart. And I tell you, you must give an account on the day of judgment for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. He's trying to let us know, church, listen, the reason why we talk the way we talk sometimes is because it's in the heart. It's in the heart. The reason why we, we go off on people like that, church, is in the heart. We still got it in the heart. Amen. The reason why we can cuss and sing Christ is King is because it's in the heart. The reason why we can, we can tell such uh, awful jokes and then can't hardly read our Bibles is because it's in the heart. Amen. Truth, church, is truth. Let's be real. Jesus is saying, is the issue what's coming out of our mouths is because of what's going on in our hearts. And if we're feeding things in our hearts that are not wholesome, it's going to come out of our mouths. Amen. Let me move on before I lose you. Here's the treatment plan of verse 29. He says, but only such as is good for building up. As it fits the occasion. Here's what he tells us our treatment plan is. If you want to start saying stuff that's wholesome, that God can be pleased at, here's what he tells us to do. Use words that add value. That's right. Use words that add value. He says, but only let such as good for building up. He says, when you're going to talk, talk about stuff that builds people up. It's all right to talk about the game. It's all right to talk about this, that, the third. But whatever you do, make sure you're building people up with your words, with the intentions of your words, not tearing anybody down. He says, not only add value, but then he says, be appropriate. Look, the same verse, he says, as it fits the occasion. Say things that make sense at the right time. Somebody, a child was died from a sickness, and somebody with no wisdom says, well, God needed her, needed your child more than you did. It's just silly. It's just unbelievably silly. Or, or, or a loved one, someone was praying for, praying for them, that they would be healed of their sickness, and they died in their sickness. And somebody actually said to a person, you must didn't have enough faith. Spiritual talk, but it was completely inappropriate. He says, as Christians, you and I must be serious about being appropriate how we speak. Here's, here's that treatment. Let us add value. Let us be appropriate. And then thirdly, look at this. He says, let's be people that alleviate burdens with our mouths. Well, he says, we should only say those things that administer grace to those who are listening to us. When somebody leaves from you, they should always say, it was good to be around that person. When they're done talking to you, they ought to be able to say, you know what? I was feeling bad, but they lifted my spirits. Every time they leave you, at least they should be able to say, I, I enjoy being around that person. And don't be like some of us who, when we see each other in the grocery store, we're ducking around the corner. Like, oh, you laughing because it's what you do. All right, I'm done. Here's the last thing. I'm going to let you go home, all right? Last thing I'm going to let you do. All right, so we've been at the doctor. The doctor has given us some diagnosis. He says we're dealing with toxic intentions. Sometimes we lie. We're dealing with toxic emotions. We have anger. We're dealing with toxic appetite. Sometimes we got sticky fingers. Stealing. He says sometimes we have toxic speech. We have worthless words coming out of our mouth. And then finally, I'm going to deal with this, and we'll let, I'll let you go home. Is that sometimes we have toxic relationships. Toxic relationships. That's in verse 30 through verse 32. He opens it up and says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you've been sealed to the day of redemption. It talks about God first. I'm not going to start there. I'm going to start at the second part of the verse. Uh, in verse 31, he says, So let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. 
he, he starts out, he talks to us about our toxic relationships. And you know, our relationships are based on our attitude towards one another. If, if you've got the right attitude about your partner, if you've got the right attitude about your partner that we're in this thing together, you're not my enemy, you, we partners in life and in death, I mean, until death. When you have the right attitude about each other, you and I were able to respect and love each other and live well with each other. But as Christians, sometimes we get caught in the darkness of the world and we treat each other as though we, we're not even close to Christ. He says, don't grieve the Lord, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God because not so much as, as, as us, we need to do some spiritual things so we don't displease God. What displeases God the most is when you and I hurt and disrespect each other. If you say this is right, you and God is right, you must know your brothers and sisters, you must be right with them. In order to be right with God, you got to be right with each other. They go hand in hand. You cannot say, I'm mad in love with God, but I really dislike a lot of people. I can't stand people. No, me and God, we got it going on. It's the people that I just can't get along with. No, something's wrong in your, in your belief. You've got, you've got this issue of, you, you create toxic relationships. You cannot be spiritual and then be mean to people at the same time. It's, it's an oxymoron when it comes to God because God is the one who sent his son to die for all of us. Amen. And none of us can treat each other the way we want to treat each other because it, it doesn't benefit us. No, God is asking us, he's saying, what grieves me is when you grieve each other. So he points it out in the text. Here's the symptoms. We have negative attitudes that we have towards family members and loved ones, and these things is what uh, hurts God. So he points out a couple of things. He talks about bitterness, which is a spirit of resentment that refuses to be reconciled. Wrath with his deep flowing anger. He, he, it's, it's a deep, a persistent anger that won't go away when you're holding that thing. Uh, anger, uh, this outburst of anger he talks about, or clamor, which is harsh speaking and, and brawling, ready to fight with your words. Slander, speaking evil about somebody, talking about somebody behind their back, putting stuff out on face about somebody because you dislike them. He's being very intentional here, church, that Christians. This should not be among Christians. He even talks about malice, which is like the general term that includes any evil act or evil word. Just doing whatever we do out of malice in our heart for somebody. You're angry with them, and I'm going to get back at them. I'm going to say, no, God is calling us out of the darkness, church. God is saying these things by his Holy Spirit are dark, and I want you to come out of these things. And so quickly, I'm done. Here's the treatment. Three things. He says, be kind to each other, be tender to each other, and be forgiving to each other. That's it. Amen. Be kind, be tender, be forgiving. Forgiveness, if you and I do not forgive, bitterness will take a hold of your heart and will run your life. If you do not forgive, you said, Reverend, they've done me wrong. I know, but forgiveness is not excusing what they've done or, 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 or trying to justify that they've done something. No, forgiveness is this, is that I'm taking them off of my hook of trying to get back at them and putting them on God's hook. And I'm going to let God have to deal with that. I want to forgive them. That doesn't always mean reconciliation. That doesn't always mean you get back together. But forgiveness means you are letting it go. You are saying, God, I'm not going to hold this in my heart because if I hold it, it's going to defile me. And all kinds of stuff is going to come out of my mouth. And the way I act is going to change because I'm letting bitterness inside of me. He says we must be kind to each other. Be tender to each other. But most importantly, church, forgiving each other. You're going to have to forgive one another. You have to forgive one another. We must practice forgiveness so that we can grow in God and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, I'm done. I ain't going to hold you no longer. I took it up all your time. Made you mad and everything. I'm just, it is what it is, what it is.